All right. Welcome, everybody, to another author chat on SFF Addicts. And today, I'm very, very happy to be chatting with Alex Jennings. He's a writer, editor, teacher, and poet living in New Orleans, a devourer of pop culture, and a lover of music, film, and comics. And his debut novel, The The Ballad of Perilous Graves, is out now through Red Hook. So welcome to the show, Alex. How are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm doing good, man. Before we dig into the interview proper, I want to say congratulations on on that release of your your debut novel. I mean, how are you feeling about it and, and how's life going in general? I'm feeling extremely excited and, and grateful about it. Uh, life is going well. There's a lot of opportunities coming my way. And it feels like a lot of the work uh, that I've done over the years has really begun to pay off at a, at a higher level. Um, I'm also very happy that the book is coming out while my my dad is still here because it's uh it's written very much for him, and uh, you know he gave me the gift of fantasy, so I kind of wanted uh, to give it back to him in this way. Oh man, that's beautiful. And I mean, on that note, that's a perfect uh, jumping off point. You know, what was your relationship with sci-fi, fantasy, that kind of thing growing up? I know you're big into comics as well, so. Yeah, um, I started reading on comics. Uh, In fact, I know exactly what issue it was. It was an issue of Uncanny X-Men where uh, Cyclops had married Madeline Pryor and moved to Alaska, and he was (laughs) still convinced that she was Jean Grey back from the dead. Yeah. And uh, so he was kind of trying to manipulate her into giving away the game. And uh, at the end of this issue, she finally used her telekinesis to hold back his eye beams. And uh, I read that when I was four years old. And I was like, I don't really understand what's going on here. That is but very complex like, for four years old. <laughs> right? <laughs> but I was like, I, I love this. Whatever is happening here is really cool with me. And so... I've been a fan of, uh, you know, fantastic literature and comics ever since. Mm. And I mean, I mean, when you were growing up, you said that your dad was kind of the person who introduced you to fantasy. What was what was that introduction, if you remember it? And when you were getting older, what was the kind of stuff you started to consume more of? Well, my dad used to read to me and my little brother every night, and uh, he read us the Narnia books, and he read us. Um, the Lord of the Rings books. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of black is evil imagery in um, Tolkien's writing. And I remember one time my dad just put the book down and was like, this is great, but I wish that there was a fantasy where everybody is black and the darkest, blackest one is the hero. Mm-hmm. And that really stuck with me. And uh, it made me think of fantasy and SF in general in a new way, as in something that could represent people like me and our concerns and the life that we live. And uh, it just, uh, it's kind of fitting that this book is coming out now when Afro-surrealism as a movement is moving toward to the fore. And, uh, you know, we've got things in kind of all media like Atlanta and Jordan Peele's movies and it's just uh it's a lot of fun and excite excitement to be working right now yeah actually that's similar to something I, I've spoken to PJ Lee Clark about he he grew up on stuff like uh you know the wheel of time and, and whatnot and Lord of the Rings and yeah like you say there's a lot of uh othering and and prejudice and and discrimination towards you know and tolkien's work the haradrim and all that kind of stuff but you know i'm glad that your dad was very honest with you guys about that and it sounds like that's the kind of thing that influenced you to later on start uh wanting to write your own stories and 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 all that so what was that process like of figuring out like yeah i want to start writing my own fiction and i want to start um getting into the position where I can provide uh, the representation that I lacked when I was a kid? Well, I kind of, I kind of started off writing X-Men fan fiction. Um, And like, that was so long ago that there weren't even a lot of ways to like post it on the internet. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, you know, I'm 13 years old and just writing this stuff. uh, And you know, I would introduce my own characters, uh, and I really enjoyed writing about them. 
and I just kind of began to realize like I don't really need the X Men for this. I could just <laughs> I, I could do just do thing. stories about these guys. Yeah, and uh, you know the the influence of Octavia Butler was also extremely important to me because I mm. I started reading her books at the first overseas post that I was at, uh, which was Paramaribo, Suriname, and uh, you know they speak Dutch in that country, and so there weren't a lot of places to get like English language SFF. Mm -hmm. um, but in the community liaison office, they had a library of donated books. And so they had like nice. just scads and scads of issues of Asimov's and FNSF and uh, Nancy Cress's work. That was a major influence mm -hmm. on me and uh, Octavia's as well. And this was back when they were still trying to uh, pass off octavia's work as like more mainstream than they considered it to be so the the covers were very misleading yeah and uh, yeah. so and they're, they're they're essentially like uh you know characters in the book that were black who would be presented as white on the cover and shit like that yeah exactly so like i was reading dawn and uh i began to slowly realize like wait this this is a black woman that's being portrayed here and she's white on the cover, but yeah. she is definitely speaking like a black person and thinking like one. Yeah. And that kind of opened a new door for me as well. Crazy. And, and you mentioned you, that, I mean, that's amazing that you caught into Octavia Butler while you were, while you were overseas, but you know, you've lived in many countries. Uh, I'm not sure the exact reason uh, why your your folks and you were moving around, but what was the influence of those different countries and those cultures and, and histories on, on you and eventually on your writing? Well, my dad worked for the State Department uh, because they, they felt it was necessary to farm Black Foreign Service agents when in the 60s, all of these African countries were uh, gaining their independence and wanting mm. to conduct diplomatic relations with people who looked like them. Right. And uh, so we moved around a lot for that, and we were mainly based out of the D.C. area. And I think that the biggest influence of um, moving around like that was a better understanding of, of culture shock and what it's like to be not just traveling to and viewing different cultures but to be immersed in them and to live there mm. uh, so living in tunisia was probably the most important part of that for me um, because a lot of folks don't know but uh, tunisia is where they shot the uh, tatooine scenes in uh, the star wars movies and in mm. fact tatooine is an actual real village in tunisia and really uh, so yeah what? oh yeah crazy <laughs> so um seeing that and seeing just how alien the landscape can be in in another country here on earth like just really opened up my mind and my imagination and yeah not to mention like interacting with people and figuring out what our commonalities are and what our differences are and how both of those are important and, and strengthening aspects it, it, I, I really would not trade that upbringing for anything. It, it taught me a lot and it was a great opportunity. Man, that's beautiful. Cause yeah, I mean, personally, all of my travels, it's just kind of like, uh, learning new, new languages, but also, uh, coming into that, that kind of communication conflict, which is for me, I don't like to view it as conflict cause it's very short lived conflict. It's like, we can figure out a way to communicate and find that commonality uh, in ways that don't necessarily mean we have to other each other. We have to be antagonistic or anything like that. We can figure this shit out. And if it comes down to body language and we just get drunk together or something like that. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, really, that's, yeah. That's just such an important experience to have. And you know, when, it, when I was at Clarion West, um, China Mieville taught there and mm -hmm. he explained his own relationship with culture shock and how, like that's one of the most important aspects of SF and yeah. how people come for that to, to, to feel like they're stopped short by these eyeball kicks of 
imaginative circumstances and peoples and landscapes. So that's, that's cool. And, and what, what was your time at, at Clarion West? Like, um, you know, what year were you there and, and what was kind of the, the takeaway from that whole process? Okay. I'm, I'm ancient. So I was there in 2003 <laughs> and it was a wonderful experience. Like it, it was like nothing I've ever experienced before. Um, the reason I went was because Octavia Butler came to my writing class at Evergreen and talked with us. And then her ride was late picking her up afterwards. And so for a good two hours, she sat with a few of us students in the writing center and just talked to us. Mm -hmm. Um, and she asked me if I wrote every day and I said, yes. And she told me that I should apply to Clarion West. And at the time I, you know, I was heartbroken because I was like, you've never read my work. I could be awful. Like, why would you say something <laughs> like that to me? But I did what she said and I did get in. And this was, this was in Seattle, first of all. And at the time they were putting together the oral histories for the uh, science fiction museum there. So not only did we have like a, a great instructor every week, but other people would come in to record their interviews at, uh, at the Clarion West house. And so that's how I was able to meet Ursula Le Guin. And uh, we met Greg Bear and Octavia came and did her interviews and hung out for a while. And I mean, it's just, it's just amazing. That must've been uh, so surreal I, to meet her. Oh, it absolutely was like, it, it was it was really, it really changed the course of my life. I think it, it almost felt like getting an accolade from her. So, mm -hmm. you know, I've been publishing in the field since 2005. And one of the things that I'm always thinking about is sort of living up to her faith in me and her example and trying to push the boundaries of what SF can be. And mm -hmm. I, I hope I've done a good job. Oh, I mean, after reading the Ballad of Perilous Grays, I'm like, yeah, man, this is a, good stuff and i like to you know talk about that a bit more but first i mean you, you said you've been publishing since 2005 uh, a lot of that has been short stories uh yeah. what was the intention behind your 2012 collection uh here i come and other stories and and you know tell, tell me a bit more about that i think the intention was just to get uh my stories in front of more readers who might not have seen them because they were they're mostly in small press outlets. Um, you know, I hadn't gotten into any of the larger magazines at that point. And I just really wanted to do something that allowed me to sort of segment my career hmm. and like divide a line between then and now yeah. and like enter a new phase of things. Cool. And, and, you know, spending so many years writing short stories, uh, tell me a bit about the sort of initial idea for the Ballad of Perilous Graves and what it was like to dive into the novel process versus, you know, doing short stories? Well, it was a weird situation because I came to New Orleans because I was sort of commanded in a visionary dream. And, <laughs> um, you know, while my brother and I were still planning to move down here, a Hurricane Katrina hit and uh, all that devastation was wrought on the city. Mm -hmm. And uh, we came down uh, after the storm to take a look around and see if it was still possible to move here. And we decided that it was. And so I got to New Orleans. The public transportation was all still free. Mm -hmm. uh, and the city was in terrible, terrible pain from what had happened to it. And I just wanted to pitch in and sort of help with the recovery. And uh, during yeah. that period... I saw a lot of uh, news stories and profiles of children who um, were forced to come back to town without their parents and sort of deal with getting themselves to school and making sure their, their needs were met as far as food and everything else. And uh, so that immediately made me think of, um, you know, my favorite or orphan in literature, which was Pippi Longstock. Hell yeah. And so <laughs> I originally wanted to make it a comic. Um, and I started thinking about what Pippi Longstocking would be like if she was like a little red bone girl living in Central City, New Orleans. Mm. And uh, the book kind of grew out of that. 
I mean, yeah, after reading after reading it, I was like, yeah, Peaches is Pippi Longstocking, 100%. So I'm very happy that you already brought that up. <laughs> but um, you you mentioned to me before we started recording that it was a very, very long process, this uh, this this novel. So, you know, tell me about the the journey uh, towards publication. Well, like when I originally came up with the idea for the novel, it was supposed to be something that I could put together quickly and get out to market uh, while I was kind of focusing on other stories that meant more to me. Uh, and it quickly took over my life and career. And it sort of became the, the definitive work of turning a corner in my development, not just as a writer, but as a person. Mm. So it began to take a lot longer, you know, and, uh, when I started it, I was you know in my early 30s, and so I was still figuring out how to be as well as how to integrate myself into the fabric of the city right. and not just be a transplant who wanted to remake New Orleans in the image of where he had come from, but as someone who has a a reverence for and a belief in the culture, the people, the music, mm -hmm. and the spirit of, of New Orleans. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes that went very smoothly, and sometimes it was difficult. And, you know, it wasn't until 2018 that I had a, a finished draft that I could be proud of and was able to start shopping it around. Yeah, but I mean that that reverence that you spoke of <clears throat> reading the book that really comes through because this feels obviously like it's your your take on New Orleans, it's very personal to you, but at the same time there's a lot of uh you know, description and and uh perspective through the eyes of these different characters for um a general just like humble respect of what the city is, you know, and that comes through, especially in something like the power and magic of music, which plays such an integral role in the, the spirit of, uh, of new Orleans and the way that you present it here, you know, music is so, uh, powerful that it can be the literal connective tissue in this, uh, in this city and its culture. So, you know, for you, like what role does music pay, play in your life and who are some of your favorite old school musicians, but then who are some of your favorite more modern artists? Uh, music is super important to me. I, I listen to music while I work. I, I listen to music while I'm just kind of relaxing around the house. Um, I, I just love it. Uh, I collect records. Um, some of my favorite old school musicians I mean, it's kind of it's kind of easy to say Louis Armstrong, but he's such an important figure. He is one of my favorites, him and uh, Sidney Bechet, especially. Uh, but there are so many from over the years like uh, jazz was born in New Orleans. But what a lot of folks don't realize is that rock and roll kind of was, too. Yeah. Um, at uh, Matassa's Records they had a pipe running along the ceiling. And so they designed the songs to, to resonate on that pipe, cool. which uh, duplicated the, you know, the circumstance of a car frame. Wow. Like they were making the music to be heard in cars. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think about that all the time. Cause I used to live right by um, the, the old recording studio, which is now a laundromat. And uh, let's see who else. Oh, James Booker. James Booker is probably my favorite pianist of all time. Yeah, I love he James Booker. Is, yeah, just a lovely guy and uh, a firecracker. Um, but I'm, I'm also, of course, majorly into Dr. John. Um, he's a huge influence on me. He appears in the book and everything. And uh, I just, I really love his spirit and like that kind of, that kind of warmth and darkness that mingles in a yeah. lot of his music. Um, as far as more current musicians, I really love uh, Lady Ray. Uh, she's an excellent soul singer, and there's just something about 
the way her songs are arranged and, mm-hmm. and the instrumentality that is just fantastic. Uh, Tank and the Bangas. I also love that band so much, like from right here in New Orleans. Um, I love Trombone Shorty. I, uh, I, still, I still stand for Lil Wayne, man. Like, <laughs> Hell yeah, man. music isn't, I mean, it, you know, like, there, there's something that, like the youth has gone out of it a little bit, mm-hmm. but like there are still flashes of it. And then I'll go back and listen to something like Six Foot, Seven Foot, off of uh the carter five and like it's just so explosive and expansive and imaginative and and clever i can't get enough of it yeah yeah man (laughs) i i have so much respect for lil wayne as well because that was like i he got really big when i was in high school so that that was playing everywhere and i actually got to see him at a music festival uh oh, yeah. in san francisco which was really cool and seeing him live was really what made me impressed because it's like this dude is tiny but yeah. he has the just such an intense uh and you know it's like on ten like what you said about dr john it's like there's like uh this sort of like warmth and, and, and that kind of stuff and humor. Cause there's a lot of humor in Lil Wayne's music as well, but then there's the darkness yeah. and that combination is just really, really, uh, yeah. intoxicating. You know what I mean? And I feel like that's the same sort of duality that you see in a place like new Orleans, where there is a lot of so much warmth and so much community, but at the same time, there's this sort of darkness to it, this underbelly. And that's something I feel like you really captured well in the book and and for you what was it like to kind of capture that atmosphere but at the same time you know take something audible like music and and write it on the page and and convey it through words i think the i think the most difficult and most crucial part was learning how to see and hear not just what i expected to see and hear but what was really there. Mm. And uh, I think talking to and making friends with as many people born and raised in New Orleans as possible was important for that. But uh, so was the advice of Victor Laval. Um, I read Big Machine several years ago, his, uh, you know, his first kind of breakout novel, and I fell in love with it. And so on a whim, I just kind of emailed him after that, telling him that the book changed my life and made me want to better integrate myself into my neighborhood and the fabric of my city and to accept people on their own terms and and connect with them in a better way. And uh, he wrote me back so warmly <clears throat> and was so encouraging. And um, I think that year he came down to the Tennessee Williams Writers Festival and I actually went to lunch with him and like a bunch of other luminaries like Matt Johnson and Roxanne Gay and Garnet Cadogan. Yeah, I had no idea any of the rest of them were going to be there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it, that's what's been important to me. And like the understanding of the music sort of comes along with that. Right. Uh, I also studied music a little bit directly at the University of New Orleans. Um, Connie Atkinson has a class called the History of New Orleans Music, where she would go all the way back from, you know, the founding of New Orleans to the present day and what the musical influences were and how they interacted with with the history of of the city. And uh, that was a real eye-opener. That helped me a lot. And uh, just seeing her... Her attitude towards the music and her understanding that people often like to pretend that the birth of jazz was a sort of happy accident Mm. when there was a lot of intentionality to it. People took those rhythms and and built them into something new. And uh, that really sort of created an underpinning for how I wanted to approach my work going forward. Um, you know, because I, I was kind of born along with hip hop and the idea of sampling has always been uh, fascinating to me. Mm-hmm. And so 
instead of doing a, a sort of regular pastiche, like the idea of lifting characters, tropes, and images out of the pop culture that I take in all the time yeah. and recontextualizing them to make them something more. Um, that's, that's kind of my abiding preoccupation when it comes to writing. <laughs> I like how you call it a preoccupation, but you know, I can imagine it's like, this is something that's really important to you. And it's kind of, uh, music is very communicative, but it's, a uh, you know, for me, it's a form of magic in and of itself, but it's very hard to capture outside of its own, uh, its own medium, you know, but I thought you did a really good it job is. of, of capturing, uh, I guess like the atmosphere of music and, and not necessarily like the, the rhythms and stuff like that, but the intentionality is what came through to me. And so I thought you did a good job of that. Yeah. Like originally I wanted to use all real songs for the book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Like I had them all written in there because uh, I didn't know that you just can't do that. Copyright's and, uh, a bitch. So it's horrible. <laughs> I know. So I had to go through and take them all out and like replace them with my own lyrics. And so, you know, I had, I had to learn to write these songs kind of in the vein mm -hmm. of the songs that I love the most. And so the only, the only real songs that are included are St. James Infirmary Blues and uh, sort of... I walk on gilded splinters because, mm -hmm. like, I don't really use the lyrics to it or anything. You just mentioned it. It's still, a, yeah, it's important to the story. Yeah, and 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 what you said about community, I thought was really important. I mean, for me, like, that's something that I've learned growing up is just more and more important. You know, family, immediate community, and that kind of thing. And there are these sort of, um, these binding factors. You know, mu music being one of them, food being another another important one, and. I want to transition a little bit to the characters because you um, you center a lot of the characters around you know their own personal struggles, but also the way that they're tied into their community and their their uh, community's history. So you know, on one hand, you have the young kids Perry, Brandy, and Peaches, who's kind of like your Pippi Longstocking analog, and then on the other hand, you have an older character Casey, who's uh, transitioned and is sort of in this weird limbo state and, and trying to figure out uh, their own sense of identity still, which a, a lot of people, regardless of your age, go through. So for you, why did you decide to have that, that contrast between like the younger kids with uh, Perry and Peaches and Brendy and then, and then Casey's storyline as well? I always had the most fun reading stories that were aimed above my head. Mm -hmm. So I knew I wanted to include these characters who are children but i also wanted to make it clear that the story is written for adults and has adult concerns and perspectives in mind because that allows you to uh, interact with the concerns and experiences of childhood with more freedom than you would if you were writing to like say third graders or something yeah that's um also my sense of home is directly tied to my sense of family. Like, you know, growing up the way I did, moving around from place to place, home was never a location for me. It was always a collection of people that I shared experiences mm -hmm. and, and love and sometimes blood with. So I based a lot of the characters on family members, sometimes uh, multiple characters on the same family members <laughs> and it helped me it helped me understand the story better you know because of course story is expressed through character but it also helped me you know find the the love that i needed to communicate yeah it's like showing love for the people that are actually in your life through this cathartic process of of writing and, and developing characters and, and intertwining all of their storylines and everything. Right. And like, I had been working on the book for years uh, before I realized that Perry was actually like a version of my dad, um, <laughs> which <laughs> that was a very intense experience. And I, yeah. I honestly stopped, like I stopped for nine months because I knew, I knew what was going to be required of that character. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I wasn't sure I had the strength to write it. No, that's totally fair. And, you know, like you mentioned, this is a story where there are 
kids who are going through this immense changes, but at the same time, um, you bring comedy in as sort of like this uh, levity factor where these characters, a lot of them comment on on what it means to be an adult, uh, or at least from their child's perspective, what they perceive as adults, which is essentially like kids and bigger bodies because they still don't know a lot of stuff. And, and, you know, how can you fully place your trust in someone who's still kind of figuring things out despite the fact that they're within this authoritative adult body and that kind of thing. So I thought you used humor very effectively to um, kind of play around with the fact that these are child characters, but this is an adult story. Well, humor is as important to me as music. I think mm-hmm. uh, I, I performed as a stand up for, you know, three and a half, four years yeah. um, while I was working on this book. Cool. And understanding like the beats of drama and of portrayal and how those work similar to like punchlines and mm. laugh lines, that was extremely helpful. Yeah. It was also helpful because, you know, writing fiction is in, in a lot of ways a waiting game. You have to wait for acceptances or rejections or this or that thing. Right. But with with stand up, it's instant gratification. Mm. You get all the cookies right now, and you get to like just suck in that energy from the crowd, <laughs> and so it helped with that too. Or reverse, it's like you get dumped on, and people are just like, "Yeah, man, that was that was <laughs> that was flat." <laughs> yeah, but you know, like after after you bomb, you kind of you kind of feel like you can take anything. It's mm-hmm. like. I've had some nightmare scenarios, man. Yeah. Like after that, I just felt made of steel. Yeah, I mean, for sure. that That's something that there are certain career uh, paths or sort of like side gigs that people can go down that really build up a thick skin. And for the publishing industry, that's a, it's a difficult thing for, for, you know, this is an obvious generalization, but people who come from more of an insulated environment where they're writing something on their own, and then they have to get to a point where they're shopping it out to an agent and then that gets shopped out to publishers and there's the possibility of rejection. There's the possibility of so many emotional uh, roller coaster scenarios. But I feel like doing stand up is the kind of thing that builds up this thick skin where it's like, oh, I got a rejection. Fuck it. You know, because how many times did you feel that on stage doing stand up oh. and then immediately yeah. just like, uh, rebounding that into improvement i think yeah i mean it was it was very helpful in that way uh i'd say one of the strangest and most uh sort of disorienting parts of like this whole process of having a book coming out and like getting more and more attention for it is that it it takes something that was like this private ritual that I would go through yeah. and people would only see the finished product, you know, published somewhere and it's made it something that has a lot of eyes on it and that has a lot of people's attention. And like, that really takes some getting used to, especially mm-hmm. because like I'm a naturally very shy person and uh, you know, like that's one of the reasons why stand up was so important to me because it made me let go of the wish to be invisible and like to not be noticed yeah but i mean yeah like piece by piece day by day these barriers get broken down a little bit and here you're talking on on camera with me so you know i appreciate that and come a long way so that's a good thing (laughs) absolutely yeah man and uh we spoke earlier about new orleans but i want to come back to that a bit because you know you um this entire novel is just a love letter to New Orleans from from my perspective and it's so integral to the story but I was curious why you decided to uh portray it in this sort of alternate reality duality kind of way where you have on one hand the New Orleans that we are familiar with in our world but then on the other side you have the fantastical surreal Nola so what was that what was that approach about. Well, I I am very aware that a lot of people who are not from New Orleans 
um, take it upon themselves to speak authoritatively on what the city's concerns are, what the city's culture is like, and and what is important or not important here. Yeah. So one of the things that I really wanted to do was to make sure that I'm not trying to um, take that narrative away from the people who are born and raised here and create the culture and have been steeped in it for generations. Yeah. So, you know, originally I just wanted to write a fun fantasy story, but it became necessary to make it clear that I didn't want to replace anybody else's voice. Mm. And so the city is mainly, you know, the setting is mainly this version of New Orleans where things are actually different. So I'm not fudging aspects of the real city or the attitudes and uh, ideas that people have in order to just set mine forth. Yeah. No, I mean, that makes sense. That makes sense. Cause it's like, regardless of where you, you go, you know, for me, I come to Ecuador and I'm in Quito, but I can't necessarily say that I represent Quito in any way other than my own perspective of it and my own experiences of it. And so I think there's this, uh, this sort of fine line that you have to walk as someone who's not a native to a city or a, or a place to, to, like you said earlier, have that reverence and, and understanding of what this city is about, its history, its community, all that kind of stuff. And then at the same time, revel in the fact that you're there experiencing it and, and, and you can, um, you can embrace it as much as you want to. And the more you embrace it, the more likely it is that you're going to be like, wow, this place is fucking awesome. And I just want to see more, more, more and experience as much as you can connect with as many people as you can. Absolutely. I, I think that comes from the most important thing I, I learned growing up, which is to be a traveler and not a tourist. Mm. And uh, I think, you know, New Orleans is kind of in a battle for its soul right now because people come down here and do things like move in uh, to a block where there's a bar that's been having live music for a hundred years and then calling the cops with noise complaints to have the music shut down. Shit. That's it. it directly hurts the culture that we love so much and what makes new Orleans itself. Yeah. hundred percent. And it kind of comes, comes back to this, uh, um, this notion of, uh, I guess like the symbolism of something like hurricane Katrina and all the devastation that, that was wrought by that. You know, you said that you came down with your brother and, and we're sort of, you know, checking out the, out, out the city after all the, after all the damage was done and thinking like, is it still viable to live here? And you decided that yes, yes it is. And and you saw something beautiful within, within that devastation, you know, at least like an opportunity to help out the community and become part of something bigger, you know, but from the sounds of it, it's like that, that physical trauma that the, the, the city was, uh, that was inflicted upon the city that kind of thing is um, still happening, but in different ways, you know, in terms of gentrification or people coming in and uh, changing the sort of like soul and dynamic of a certain neighborhood and the culture and the history are being erased just like bit by bit, you know? Yeah. And I, I never wanted to be party to that. I, I want to, I want to give back to the city that has given so much to me because all of like most of the most important things that have come to me in my life have come to me here. I've been living here, you know, for 16 years now. Mm -hmm. Um, there are a lot of writers who are also able to capture that soul of the city and portray it in a very humane and very clear way. Like for instance, um, Maurice Carlos Ruffin, um, he recently released a book of short fiction called The Ones Who Don't Say They Love You. And uh, for my money, he's the, he's the best one working in that vein. Nice. Uh, Lady Hubbard is also fantastic. Cool. And that actually leads me perfectly into my next question, which is, you know, you included two big historical cameos other than like all the musical references and, and Dr. John and all that kind of stuff. Um, 
you know, first up is Stagger Lee, uh, which I had never, I mean, I grew up in Canada, so I'd never really heard the, the, the legend of Stagger Lee or heard any songs or that kind of thing. But once I started getting more into blues music, then his name comes up quite a bit. And then there's a podcast that I listened to called Our Fake History. And he did an episode on, you know, what's the truth about uh, the Stagger Lee legend and all that kind of stuff, which was really fascinating. But for you, why did you uh, center on him in this sort of antagonistic role and bringing in the history of of the American South and and focusing in on a character like Stagger Lee? Stagger Lee is such an important character to American history uh, because for one thing, American history is black history. Mm -hmm. And I am also endlessly fascinated by people who are transmuted into stories like Stagger Lee, like that, that murder happened, I believe in 1900, 1901. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he killed Billy Lyons in an argument over his Stetson hat in uh, East St. Louis. And people have never stopped talking about it. And like the, the first time I heard the version of that murder ballad where Stagger Lee is uh, taken by the police when he's hanged and he goes to hell and he takes over, that is, <laughs> that was extremely powerful for me. And then oddly enough, um, I think something that solidified it was reading uh, the Andy Duncan story, Belutha Hatchie. Um, it's, you know, it's the title story of his, uh, first collection. And, uh, he writes this character that, that seems a lot like, uh, High John the Conqueror. Um, and he's based on Robert Johnson and he, you know, he finds himself in this suburb of hell, um, that's lorded over by this, um, white landowner, um, version of the devil. And, like something about that just kind of mixed with the the Stagger Lee stories that I've heard and the songs and um, this, you know, alternate version of New Orleans that I wanted to create. And he just kind of grew out of that. That's awesome. Yeah. And, you know, for me, that was just kind of crazy serendipity to hear this podcast episode and be like, oh, shit, he's a character in this book now. And and to have a little bit more context for the history of this character and um, a deeper understanding, a deeper understanding of the references and stuff that came up. And then another one, another historical figure that you use is, uh, Lafcadie O'Hearn, uh, who I know from his, I'm not going to spoil anything because this is very central to, to the novel itself, but, um, I just, I, I know him from his writings, uh, of, on Japan and how he kind of introduced the West to Japanese culture and history and that kind of stuff. Um, but I did not know that he had a history with New Orleans and he has writings on New Orleans as well. So uh, for you, like, what do his writings uh, mean or reflect? And then at the same time, why did you then decide to include him in the, in the novel as well? I would say that his writings were what really showed me that the character of New Orleans hasn't significantly changed since the 1850s. Um, no matter the cosmetic changes that there have been, the city has still always had a lot of this dysfunction. And it's almost as if it was built crumbling. And um, his writing about the city and its food and its people is still very immediate and, and very relevant. Kind of similarly to the way uh, John Kennedy Toole wrote about the city in Confederacy of Dunces. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, like those were white perspectives that had uh, certain agendas to them. Mm -hmm. And so I thought it would be interesting to see what Lafcadio O'Hearn would think of this sort of altered version of new orleans at right angles and uh honestly to tell you the truth i didn't know it was him <laughs> until i was knee deep uh in drafting the book 
I thought the character's name was Runcible Spoon. <laughs> it was a character created by some friends of mine. Yeah. Uh, but he introduced himself as Lefkady O'Hearn, I think, when I was thinking about the book in bed that night. And uh, I realized it just had to be him. I mean, it comes together perfectly because it's like this uh, fusion of real life history, but also the way that you merge that with the fantastical uh, side, like the flip side of, of New Orleans with NOLA. And, you know, from the sounds of it, it's like you you had a healthy dialogue with Hearn's writings, but also uh, the way he represents New Orleans. And then you were able to create this uh, retort in the form of in the form of a novel that's from your perspective and from from a black perspective as well so i thought that was a really uh fantastic uh twist on everything thanks i mean that was the idea i hope i did a good job <laughs> <laughs> you did you did definitely and you mentioned a few a few writers earlier who are uh who have written uh interesting things about new orleans and and if if there are any other writers or figures that you feel represent uh, New Orleans in a in a positive and and genuine way. Oh, absolutely. Um, Desiree Evans is one certainly. Uh, she's just fantastic, and um, I think her her star is rising right now, and I'm excited to see what she does going forward. I think I think she's got uh, her first novel is middle grade, and uh, she won the Ernest Gaines Award for that. And uh, yeah, she's just excellent. And uh, I mentioned Lady Hubbard earlier. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lady is not from here, but she has lived here for several years. And like a lot of her stories in her most recent collection um, called The Last Suspicious Holdout, a touch on New Orleans and life here. And she's just fantastic. She's also been extremely kind to me over the years. Um, You know, Nisi Shaw set a story here once that I found deeply affecting and I can't remember the name of it right off the top of my head, but it's in her first collect in their first collection, Mm -hmm. uh, filter house. And it's so good. And Nisi has also been very kind to me over the years. Uh, and I, I love their work so much and I'm really proud that I get to work with them and also call them a friend. Yeah. Awesome. man. I'm, I'm really really excited to check this stuff out and yeah I've, I've i've listened to a bunch of stuff that nisi's done and also read some of her work and i definitely agree but yeah i haven't i haven't heard of the other two so that's kind of like your book got me on a bit of a new orleans fix so i'm like okay i need to listen to some jazz and some blues and just kind of immerse myself in that a little bit and read some stuff about uh about new orleans and and lafcadio hearns like however problematic uh it is you know, like you said, it does, uh, it does reflect New Orleans of a certain time, despite the fact that it's, you know, from a perspective that can, you know, show discrimination or racism or, uh, negligence or, or, uh, overshadowing certain, certain cultures. It's interesting because we're kind of in dialogue with a lot of works and uh, with the memories of a lot of writers Mm -hmm. whose ideas were not particularly enlightened at the time. Yeah. And, uh, you know, unlike, uh, I I would not place Left Caddy or Hearn in the same league for that as like H.P. Love. No, no, definitely not. Uh, For instance, like he's more in the Flannery O'Connor range. I, I, love Flannery O'Connor's work. It's yeah. fantastic. But her best work was the work that did not have black people in it um, because I feel like she didn't particularly <laughs> uh, like or understand black people very well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like her work still has value. Yeah. And uh, just as left Caddy O'Hearns does. And even H.P. Lovecraft's work has value to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cause that vision, even though it was coupled with this virulent, terrible racism i don't know it still hits a chord with me yeah from the perspective of you know atmosphere and style he's like you can you can take you can take uh inspiration from things despite its uh pretty shitty undertones or in the case of lovecraft overtones but um right yeah 
And, uh, you know, now that, that the ballad of perilous graves is out, you know, what does the future hold for you as a writer? What are you looking forward to? What are you, uh, working on now? I've got, I got some things on the boil. I've got another novel that I'm working on and hopefully uh, that won't take as long to come out. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I enjoy working with orbit and like, I'm blessed to have just such a wonderful editor in Nivea Evans. Um, and you know, we've got, we've got some tricks up our sleeves to show folks. Hell yeah, man. Well, I'm very, very excited to to check that out. And, you know, just to close out, uh, what are you currently reading, watching, listening to that you'd like to to recommend to viewers and listeners? I'm currently reading The Ghost Sequences by A.C. Wise. I, I love A.C. Wise's short stories. I, I also very much enjoyed uh, her recent novel, Windy Darling. And I'm looking forward to the sequel to that, like kind of focusing on Captain Hook. And uh, yeah, that's mostly what i'm reading right now anything that you're listening to that you'd like to recommend oh yeah um blues from the gutter by champion jag dupree mm. is just one of my favorite records of all time i can't stop listening to it i wrote a lot of the book to it in fact you know there's <laughs> a there is a spotify playlist um that we put together for this book nice under the same uh name as the as the novel um that has a lot of my favorite stuff on it awesome and send me the link for that and then i'll include that in the in the uh show notes for the podcast and the and the youtube video we can uh absolutely get the word out and i, I definitely want to check that out as well because yeah this this book just has me aching to listen to some some good blues and jazz and that kind of stuff and uh absolutely you know, Alex, I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me today. And I recommend everyone go check out The Ballad of Perilous Graves. Uh, you can find it on Amazon and all the usual places, but please support your brick and mortars if you can. And, uh, you know, whether you're a fantasy lover, music lover, that kind of thing, this is a beautiful fusion. And uh, I think you'll really dig this novel. So, Alex, can you please tell listeners and viewers where they can find you on social media, where they can check out more of your work? Um, I'm on Twitter and Instagram as Magic Negro, M-A-G-I-C-K, um, you know, based on that trope uh, that you find in a lot of fantasy and SF. <laughs> and uh, I'm also on Facebook. And, like, I've started trying to use TikTok more. It makes me feel very old, but I do try to do it. <laughs> and I think I have the same name on there as well, but don't quote me on that. I'm not totally sure. <laughs> It's all good, man. I haven't, I haven't even bothered with TikTok. I'm just like, I'm, I don't care. But no, it's like Vine all over again. I yeah. keep thinking it's going to collapse any minute. <laughs> yeah, and uh, your Twitter handle right now. So it's like your Twitter handle is Magic Negro, but then your your name is fucking fantastic. Death Cab for for cooties. I was like, uh, Alex has amazing uh, names on Twitter. He just changes it up every once in a while, but they're hilarious. So I do. Thank you. Yeah. But uh, Alex, thank you for for hanging out with me and and chatting about your book. I really enjoyed it, and uh, I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so much. This has been great. Yeah, I really man. appreciate it. Oh, me too, man. It's a pleasure.